Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today, we have a, another herstory story for you. And this story is one of resilience and a half. But I have a question for you all first. Okay, are we going to come up or what? Stop, okay, come here, come on. Okay, she's back, okay, we're back. What do you think of when you hear the phrase pioneer woman? If you're anything like me, you think of a woman who is the amount of strength that I can never, ever meet up to. Pioneer with no. Mm -mm. And the woman in today's video is no less of a unbelievably strong, resilient woman. And what if I were to tell you that this woman is not only a pioneer woman, She's a Mormon pioneer woman, and she Hi. was part of the first company to enter the Salt Lake Valley as a free African-American Mormon pioneer. And that woman is Jane Elizabeth Manning James. Let's get started. Jane Elizabeth Manning James was born on May 11, 1813 in Wilton, Connecticut to parents Isaac Manning and Eliza Phyllis Mead. Her parents were a free, her family was a free African-American family who lived in rural Connecticut. Jane was one of at least five siblings, Louis, Peter, Sarah, Angelique, and Isaac. Don't know if it's Isaac Jr. or Isaac II, all I know is that her brother's name is Isaac. Moving on. When Jane was six years old, she was sent to live with a rich white family called the Fitches. She was raised specifically by the Fitches' daughter for the next 30 years. Don't fully know why she was sent to live with them. I don't know. But she was a servant for them, doing the cooking, cleaning, ironing, I'm assuming farm work etc. Since Jane was raised with the Fitch family, she was raised as a Christian. She was baptized into the Presbyterian Church when she was 14 years old. In her autobiography, she said that after she was baptized, she didn't quite feel satisfied, saying that, quote, it seemed to me there was something more that I was looking for which I believe we can all relate. She was with the Presbyterian Church for about 18 months when in the fall of 1842, two LDS missionaries, missionaries are basically a people of a faith that go and teach others about their faith. Think of Jehovah's Witness or Scientology. <laughs> That's a really stupid joke, but I like it. <laughs> One of the missionaries was an elder named Charles Weasley Wandell. Charles and his fellow missionary traveled to Janestown to preach to them about the LDS faith. Now the pastor of Jane's church actually forbade her from attending this preach because she simply wanted to go. I don't know why, just, I don't know why. <clears throat> So many throat things are happening. But when that following Sunday arrived, she went anyway. When the preach was done, Jane was fully immersed and convinced that the LDS gospel was the true gospel and she embraced it 1000%. The next Sunday, she was baptized and became a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I'll explain what they are later on. Stay with me here. Later, she told many family and friends about her new beliefs and even got some of them to transition into the LDS church with her. About a year later, Jane and seven other members of her family, which were her mother, three brothers, two sisters, and her sister-in-law, wanted to be with others of their own faith. And it was around this time that Jane had had her first son named Sylvester, who was born on March 1st, 1835. It was after coming to the conclusion that they wanted to be with members of their their own faith that they started for the city of Novu in Illinois in Hancock County along the Mississippi River. This group of eight started their journey in 1842 or 43 with other LDS missionaries and their leader of this group so happened to be Charles Wandell. The journey was a measly 1,100 miles. 
pizza cake in 1800s USA. They started in Wilton and traveled by canal to Buffalo, New York, where they were supposed to go to Columbus, Ohio. But Jane's family got separated from the main group because they couldn't afford the train ticket from New York to Ohio. So what do you do if you can't afford a train ticket in the 1800s? You walk. And that is exactly what Jane and her family did. They walked the remaining 800 miles on foot, saying, quote, we walked until our shoes were worn out and our feet became sore and cracked open and bled until you could see the whole print of our feet with blood on the ground. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> no, no. You know, whenever I, whenever I read about pioneers and just the insane amount of walking they did, I think to the scene in a movie called 17 Miracles where this pioneer mom just can't go on anymore. Her feet hurt too much. And so she just sits on a rock and is just like, Leave me here. Let the wolves eat me. <laughs> Frankly, I don't know about you guys, but I would sit right next to her. <laughs> Along Jane and her family's journey, they stopped and prayed to God in Christ. I would too if my feet are bleeding to heal their feet. And somehow they woke up that next morning and their feet were fully healed. It gets crazier. They arrived in Peoria, Illinois, about 124 miles outside of Novu, where police threatened to put them in jail, believing they were fugitive slaves and demanded paperwork to prove their freedom. Jane and her family had no idea what the police were talking about because they had never been slaves in the first place. But somehow, the police let them go. This is in 1800s USA and they let a family of black people off the hook. Okay, after that little sidetrack, they continued their travels, got to a river, there was no bridge, no problem. They just walked through the water. The only issue is in the middle of the river, the water came up to their necks. And remember, this is in the middle of an Illinois forest in the winter time in pioneer clothes which I don't know if you know, are not exactly the most insulating of clothes, but they continued on. They slept on the open forest floor, woke up that next morning to frost on their faces, kept walking on bare feet, their shoes pieced out long ago, but they kept their spirits up singing hymns, thanking God for his mercy and blessings. And somehow or another, soon they arrived in their haven of rest that came in the form of Novu, Illinois. After just amazing 800 miles, being frozen in their clothes and having no shoes. Again, no, I'm not doing that, no. <laughs> When they arrived in Novu, they ran into a couple by the name of Emma and Joseph Smith, and you'll understand why that's a big doozy, who opened their large home to the Manning family to stay and begin to establish roots. The Smiths were very kind and accommodating, according to Jane. Once the Mannings had established roots and moved out of the Smith household, Jane actually decided to stay. Jane lived and worked in the house alongside Emma. And at one point, Emma even invited Jane to be adopted into the Smith family through a priesthood ceiling, which is basically being eternally united united under God. She declined this offer, but Jane still believed in Joseph's prophet role. Stay with me, stay with me. I'm, I'm getting to this and stay with me. I popped my wrist. During this time, Jane learned more about the Book of Mormon and the translations, and she began to gain an even deeper understanding and love and respect for the Mormon temple. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about Joseph Smith and the LDS faith. Now, disclaimer, this is going to be a very brief, I'm gonna say it again, very brief of an extremely important story and faith, but you need to know this story and this faith in order to understand Jane's story. Okay, here we go. The LDS religion is a religion. 
<laughs> that is based on the belief that when Joseph Smith was 14 years old, he was in the woods when he saw slash had a vision of Jesus and God telling him not to join Christianity. Three years later, an angel named Moroni came to Joseph in his bedroom and told him to unearth a book of golden plates that were the true word of God and translate these plates into what would become the Book of Mormon and spread the teachings to the masses. And Joseph said, I can do that. When the translations were finished and he started to bring these teachings to the masses, he started gaining fame and followers. In 1830, Joseph officially created the Latter-day Saints movement, aka LDS. It is important to know that the LDS followers were not liked throughout most of the North and Eastern parts of the United States. And because of that, Joseph faced great opposition, suspicion, and persecution. In February of 1844, Joseph and his brother Hiram were thrown in jail on charges of treason. And before their trial could begin, an anti-Mormon mob broke in and assassinated Joseph and his brother on June 27, 1844. That is an insultingly short explanation of this religion and the story, but it is an important one to understand. All right, here we go. Like many people of the Mormon faith, Jane was devastated about Joseph's death and took it hard. She described it as a time of great agony and sorrow because Joseph was like family to her. Him and his wife took her family in when they had first arrived in Novu, and she had a front row seat to learn more about a religion that she respected and loved and was devoted to with all her heart. So when Joseph died, it was like losing a family member. After the assassination, Jane went to live with another LDS big wig member named Brigham Young. Now, Brigham Young was essentially Joseph Smith's right-hand man. And when Joseph died, Brigham Young took over as leader of the LDS faith. It was at this time she met and married her husband and fellow free black man and LDS member, Isaac James. After the assassination of Joseph Smith, it was a major catalyst for the Mormon faith. They knew for a fact they were no longer welcomed in the East, so they decided to move West and find their own haven free of hatred, which I think we all would want to do at this point in time. In 1846, the Mormons began to migrate West and Jane decided to join them. Though her family had joined and was faithful to the LDS church, Jane was the only one to migrate west. At this point, Jane was pregnant with her second son, Silas James. Here's where the story starts to get crazy and awesome. <laughs> Jane, her husband, and her first son, Sylvester, were part of the original group of Latter-day Saints to begin the pilgrimage west and spent the winter of 1946-47 at Winter Quarters, Nebraska. Her group was also part of the Ira Eldridge Company, which was another migrating company going westward. And here's the awesome part. Jane's Pioneer Company was the first company to enter the Utah Valley on July 24th, 1847, saying, quote, without any serious mishaps, the Lord's blessing was with us and protected us all the way. And on that date, that made her the first black woman to step foot in the Utah Valley. Yes! <laughs> Now I'm not making this up, okay? I really am not. There are documents in the LDS church proving that Jane Elizabeth Manning James was the first African-American woman to step foot in the Utah Valley as a Mormon pioneer. I need a blink, yes! <laughs> we won the world, girls, we won the world, girls. Okay, we're going to take a quick pause and realize how long this odyssey of a journey was. <laughs> Jane, pregnant, and I'm assuming walked the whole time because they just walked the whole time, from Novu, Illinois to Salt Lake City, they walked a grand total of 1,315 miles. That's a no for me. Straight up no. Nope, not gonna happen. And I'm assuming the shoes gave out at some point in time. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just not walking. 1,300 miles. 
In the first years of living in Utah, the James family's life was difficult to say the very least. They lived in poverty and often didn't have the essentials for survival. But as always, Jane, resilient as ever, showed incredible charity and strength. For example, a neighbor of hers had no food for herself or her children until the next harvest and her husband was on a mission in California. And remember, this is 1800s USA. You can't just go to your local CVS and buy a frozen pizza. If your crops failed, you're starving for the winter. That's just the way it was. So Jane gave her two pounds of flour, which was half of what she had. And she needs to feed herself, her husband, and her two sons. <sighs> Despite the many hardships, Jane's life was also full of joyous memories. Her daughter was born in May of 1848, making her the first black child born in Utah. Boom. And soon after her daughter's birth, things began to get more stable for the James family. In the 1860s, they built a home and got some farmland and animals, including an ox, horses, cows, sheep, and chickens. She spun and made clothes for her kids for about two years, which was a great thing to pick up because the family was growing. <laughs> Between 1848 and 1860, Jane had many more kids, including Marianne, Miriam, Ellen, Jossie, Jerry, Bolin, another Isaac, and Villite, Valite, Vel, Valtite, Val, the, whatever. Adding her two sons, that made a total of 10 kids. Her husband worked with Brigham Young, who helped them acquire the land and animals. Everything is going great for Jane, her family, and the newly settled Utah pioneers, until one of the most historic famines in Mormon pioneer history came in 1848, when the first crops in Utah were threatened by a plague of crickets and grasshoppers. This became known as the Cricket War of 1848. And if you don't know, crickets and grasshoppers are vicious insects. They decimated everything Jane and other Utah residents had. Jane described it best, saying, quote, the crickets and grasshoppers came along carrying destruction wherever they went, laying our crops to the ground, stripping the trees of their leaves and fruit, bringing poverty and dissolution throughout this beautiful valley. Mind you, again, this is 1850s Utah. Sure, trains were around, but they didn't reach Utah and they wouldn't reach Utah until the Transcontinental Railroad of 1869. So these people, they're on their own. And imports and exports were done by ox teams, which took weeks to do. So they're freaking screwed. Jane's family suffered in the cold. They were hungry, freezing, starving. <laughs> Yet through all this hardship, she kept believing the Lord was with her and her family. When it appeared that their newly settled haven of sanctuary was lost forever, a white cloud in the form of, oddly enough, seagulls flew in and devoured all of the crickets and grasshoppers. And in honor of the bird that saved the Utah pioneers, the California gold became the state bird of Utah. And to this day, you see these birds everywhere. I live in Utah, you see them everywhere. Why? But unfortunately, in 1869, her husband divorced and left the family. Now there are no records showing that Isaac had any lasting relationships with Jane or any members of his family again. And this divorce just started a downward spiral. <laughs> this is where things just get shitty. After her divorce, she couldn't afford the farmland anymore, so she traded the land for a property closer to the center of the city in Salt Lake City. After this, the spiral just 
kept going down and down and down. Her daughter, Mary Ann, and two of her infant sons died over an 11 month period from May 1870 to April of 1871. That next year, her son Silas died of consumption. Then in 1874, her daughter Miriam and her youngest child died. This poor lady. <laughs> Within four years, Jane remarried to her son Sylvester's father-in-law, Frank Perkins. This marriage unfortunately lasted less than two years, at which Jane started to become really worried about her eternal welfare, which I would too at this point in my life, seeing everything die around me. <laughs> So she started a petition to the first presidency to be endowed and sealed along with her kids to Walker Lewis, a major, but very rare, African-American Mormon elder. Unfortunately, her petitions were either ignored or just flat out refused. Yet once again, Jane didn't give up her hope or faith, praying that she would be blessed as the prophet Joseph explained to her. Her faith was strong and true. I say this because even though she contributed financially to the building of the Logan, Manti, and St. George temples, as an African-American, she was not allowed to enter. Around the year 1900, Jane is over 80 and nearly blind. <laughs> She decided to dedicate her remaining life to documenting her life story with known LDS member, Sister Elizabeth J.D. Roundy, who was a pioneer in family history gaining efforts. Jane became a widow in November of 1891 when her husband Isaac died. Another quick pause, take in how much this poor woman has gone through in her 80 years of life. At this point, she has seen her husband die, all but two of her children die, survived winters, illnesses, more death, poverty, famine, everything has been thrown at this woman. But through it all, she kept her faith strong. She had 18 grandchildren, eight of which survived into adulthood, and they gave her seven great grandchildren. She lived in her tiny home in the Utah Valley with her brother Isaac, who moved in with her after the remaining of Jane's family died. They are the last two members of her mother's family. So it just made sense for him to move in so that they could be together. Again, more death around her. And she prayed that her brother would stay in her home after her passing. Now, I don't know if her brother stayed in her home because Jane outlived him. She died on April 16th, 1908 at the age of 95. 95 years old. I'm assuming completely blind at this point, but she could be doing backflips for all I know. <laughs> Do you know how much of a feat that is? Do you know how much of a feat that is? People normally died when they were 20 or 30, whatever. The point is, she lived to almost 100 years old in 1800s, 1900s USA. Just goes to show, black don't crack. <laughs> She passed in Salt Lake City, a place that she described as her haven of beauty. And as a Utah resident and born and raised here, I can say I couldn't agree more. In 2005, Margaret Blair Young directed a 20 minute documentary based on Jane's life called Jane Manning James, Your Sister in the Gospel. It's been viewed on PBS and was viewed at This Is The Place Heritage Park in Salt Lake City. I'll leave a link to the documentary in the description. I highly recommend you watch it. It's fascinating. In 1999, a monument was dedicated to her and was placed near her grave in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. On October 12th, 2020, 2018, a movie was released about her life and her relationship to Emma Smith named Jane and Emma. Highly recommend you watch it. It's fascinating to see how strong their bond was, especially for a black and white woman in the 1800s. Her autobiography ended with her stating quote, this is just a concise but true sketch of my life and experience. Yours in truth, Jane Elizabeth James. This video, <laughs> is an extended but true sketch of her life and experience. Now, if you take anything from this, be resilient, 
and don't lose faith in anything. If you learned something today, please like, share, and subscribe to this channel. And while you're down there, please leave a friendly comment. And until next time, don't be well behaved. You just might make history. Yours in truth, everybody. I will see you next week. Thank you.